Uh, I want to introduce our keynote speaker, and I have to tell a quick little story in doing that because I was talking to my daughter, Stacy, um, this summer, and I was telling her about the symposium and saying, you know, we, we really need to find a, a really outstanding keynote speaker. And my daughter's in New York. She's at, in graduate school at Columbia, and she works uh, for Nike as well. And uh, she said, you know what? I was at this event recently, and I heard this fellow, uh, Miguel McKelvey, speaking. And he's with an outfit called WeWork. And I think they just raised like a billion dollars, and they, they really uh, are really fast growing uh, dynamic company, and he, in particular, spoke very well about what they're doing to empower entrepreneurs in these urban settings, and they're like in 17 different cities and so forth. So she was telling me all this stuff. I didn't know about WeWork before this conversation with my daughter, but the more I learned about it, I said, wow, this is really an impactful company that's doing work in the urban space, empowering urban entrepreneurs. And so uh, I said, you know what? Uh, I would love to have this guy come, but I don't know him. And uh, my daughter has like 61,000 followers on Instagram, and she said, Miguel is following me. <laughs> and so uh, she sent him a direct message to say, would you be interested in participating in my father's <laughs> seminar? And he said, you know, I think I would. So we talked and we, we hooked it up. And so, uh, you know, that's the, that's the first big indication of the power of social media for me. Uh, it, it was a tangible thing. Uh, but uh, Miguel is the co-founder and chief creative officer of WeWork, where he directs uh, all architecture, design, and construction activities. Uh, WeWork is a, a co-working and community building uh, company. They have co-working spaces, really high level, well-designed uh, co-working spaces in a number of different uh, cities. And uh, Miguel is a multiple, multi, multidisciplinary designer and entrepreneur with diverse experience in architecture, design, construction management, and web development. Prior to WeWork, uh, he created the design framework and the, led the national uh, retail rollout for American Apparel, uh, which was 170 stores. And he was involved in the early stage development of several companies, including Green Desk, uh, Barrel 3, Versation, and English Baby. Uh, and uh, Miguel earned his BA in architecture from the University of Oregon. So I'm pleased and uh, happy to uh, introduce Miguel McKelvey as your keynote speaker. Hello, good morning. Um, you guys are far away, so I'm going to stand as close as I can. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm an outsider to Detroit, obviously. Uh, I'm not from here, but I've been coming here relatively regularly, um, at least once a year, it seems, since about 2005, when uh, I started working with American Apparel. And, um, you know, as an outsider, I have to say that it's a pretty extraordinary time uh, for you guys and for the people who are here, because, you know, in 2005, I was coming here looking for a location for an American Apparel store, and I, I tried really hard. I met with all the people I could to try to understand, you know, is there a place, is there a, a location? We did a lot of non-traditional locations for retail back then, and we were working hard to try to find a place where um, we could sort of, you know, ignite something. Uh, and it was tough. It, it, unfortunately, I couldn't convince anyone uh, that there was a certain street that was about to turn over, that was about to come that, that next spot. So we ended up doing stores in Royal Oak and Ann Arbor and East Lansing. And um, it, was, it always felt like, you know, I had some regret related to that because I felt like even one store like American Apparel coming to um, Detroit could have been something and who knows what would have followed. But um, the thing that's amazing now is that, you know, looking at it and coming here, the energy level is totally different. The dedication, the conversations that are happening, the conversations that I'm having with people now are, they're so much different and it's, it's really exciting. So from a brand perspective, you know, as you guys probably all, all know, Detroit is strong. And, you know, I think one of the really interesting things for the people that are here is to figure out how to balance that feeling that, you know, people from the outside are looking at Detroit as a place of, you know, change and hope and um, potentially uh, innovation and cre creation and, um, you know, there's people in Brooklyn who are who think Detroit is the coolest place in the world, 
where, you know, the Brooklyn for a long time has, has been that sort of symbolic place of creativity and, um, and creation. So, um, so there's something good happening, but at the same time, you know, you guys want Detroit to be built from the inside. You want the stuff, you want the good stuff to come from the insiders, not from the outsiders, you know, coming here. So there's, there's a balance to be struck. So um, I, have, I wish I could say more about that. I, I certainly don't know enough to qualify um, to speak about you know, what's happening here. But what I did want to talk about um, is a little bit more of a personal story. I do have some stuff about WeWork, but you know, like, a lot of that stuff is online, and I'm sure there's some good slides here. But um, I just wanted to talk more about, you know, for me, how, what entrepreneurship means and sort of what a difference it can make. Um, I grew up in a small town in Oregon called Eugene, which is where the University of Oregon is. And um, most people didn't even know about the University of Oregon um, until uh, Nike was started there. And uh, so when I was a kid in Eugene, it was a pretty depressing place. Uh, uh, all the storefronts downtown were closed because the timber industry had made a lot of towns in Oregon um, sort of booming in the 70s, but in the 80s, a lot of the towns just sort of shut down. And so I grew up in a place where there really didn't feel like there was anything cool going on. It was like you could ride through the downtown on your bike and literally not see a person. Um, so on a much smaller scale, there was a lot of similarities. But, um, but Nike started and they located a store uh, in the downtown area, literally like the size of the stage. And that was like, that was like the one incredibly inspiring thing that was happening. You know, to be able to walk into that store and, you know, see the releases, uh, whatever, every quarter, every six months, every year of the new Nikes that came out, for me as a kid was really like, I mean, it was my favorite place in town. My mom, I said this last night, but she would sort of use that store as a babysitter. She would like drop me off, i go sit in the store for like two hours and just like take each one off the shelf pretending like I could afford it um, and, uh, and then put it back and then move on to the next one. And, um, and so it was, it was it, it, as a representative thing, uh, for me it always became the thing that like, when you're a, a young person in the city, you know, you need these like beacons of hope. You need these things that tell you like anything is possible. And so obviously to like watch Nike grow from being just a little shop uh, in town um, to be actually a massive company was a pretty incredible thing to, uh, to happen. And so I think that for me it was always sort of like this thing that it sort of gave me the idea that anything was possible. So um, I, I studied architecture. I was like, my dream was to move to New York and become an architect. And uh, I don't know where that came from, just wherever, it just bubbled up sometime. That that's, New York was the place for me. And, um, but before I went, I graduated from school and one of my best friends was living in Japan, in Tokyo. And he was like, why don't you come over for a vacation? And I was like, well, that's a cool idea. I'll go over to Tokyo. It's not, uh, it's not common to have a friend living in a place that far away. So I went over to visit him and we were hanging out. This is gonna make me sound old, but um, at the time there was this TLC song called No Scrubs. Um, <laughs> really popular, some of you guys may know it. But, um, but you know, the language in that song is confusing for people who are learning English or who wanna learn English, right? Like, what's a scrub was, a, was like a pretty complicated question. Um, but we were the guys to answer it, right? Because we're the Americans you know, we were out at the, I mean, literally at a sushi bar. They played that song like so much. We would go into like a department store, a sushi bar, a club, like it was everywhere. And so everyone, everyone wanted to know. And so we, we saw an opportunity and it sounds crazy that like a song would be the start of a business model, but that's like all it takes. If your mindset is like, hey, I see a problem, I want to solve it. And we were literally like, if we can figure out how to replicate us and, and, uh, and answer that question. I mean, I don't know how many million people there are in Tokyo, but there's a lot. And we thought, there's a business there if we can be like that link between what people learn in school um, in their English classes that they're really hungry for, and then that real authentic sort of American uh, uh, you know, understanding of, of the language. So um, we created a company called English Baby in a tiny apartment having no, barely understanding, like we couldn't even like figure out how to collect, like we had a business model, but we didn't know how to collect payments. Um, and we, you know, the way that they paid for stuff back there was that back then there was no online, this is before PayPal and all that other stuff. So what would happen is you would sign up on the website and then to pay your bill, you'd have to go to a, a convenience store like a 7-Eleven 
and you'd actually give money to like the person at the, at the front desk at the counter at the 7-Eleven, and then they would hold it, and then I would have to go around Tokyo and pick it up in an envelope, and like say, like, hey, I'm here to collect the like two dollars that this person just paid for their membership at English Baby, and I did that. I was you know traveling all around town, and I, and I was willing to do that because it was like incredible experience. It was something that for me, like regardless of what happened, whether it was a successful business or not. It was an amazing experience to learn from and to grow from. And I think that that's kind of like the perspective you've got to have is like, it's not necessarily about some huge success, like, you know, I'm going to become a millionaire or whatever. But especially when you're young and you're figuring it out, you've got to feel like you're a sponge. You've got to feel like you're going to try anything. You're going to do everything. You're going to push yourself to do things that are outside of your comfort zone because those will become the learning experiences that will help you in the future to do, you know, hopefully many other things. So, um, to fast forward a little bit, um, I still had the dream to be the architect in New York. Uh, I was running a company that was about 20 people in Portland, uh, English Baby, which, you know, is a cool little company. But I still had this need to, to go to New York, and so I started applying for jobs. Um, as an architect, but I hadn't worked in architecture for you know four and a half years, and so no one was responding to to, to my resume. I also said I lived in Oregon, so you know no one no one wants to hire someone from all the way across the country. So um, at one point, one of my friends was like, "Hey, you know I don't think anyone's going to respond to you, um, but you should you know lie and say that you live in New York and see what happens." So um, I, I altered my resume to um, say my friend who lived in Queens address. And literally, that one switch um, changed the responses. I immediately got some uh, some interview uh, interviews granted, and so um, I went to New York. I got on a plane, go to to a job interview. The first time I ever went to Brooklyn was uh, for one of these interviews, and I got off the the, the subway, and it was like this is uh, Dumbo in 2004, which Dumbo has become one of the most sort of expensive neighborhoods in Brooklyn, but at the time it was still a lot more rough, and uh, I went into a building where there was like, you know, I mean, I took pictures of it, and it was like, you know, really beat down. The walls were, you know, like scrawled with graffiti, and there was like the directory was like sharpie on the wall saying like, you know, 203 that way, 205 that way, and there was a whole bunch of, you know, strange businesses in there, some shady, some, um, who, well, who knows, um, but, um, but. You know that experience, that exploration, that feeling that I was doing something exciting was sort of worth that adventure. Was worth that that risk, that fear of being there. So I go into the office. I'm expecting like New York architecture firm. It's going to be like all these cool guys, like people dressing in cool clothes. And like so, I I've gone to TJ Maxx the night before and bought like um, pleated pants and like wingtips and like a button-down shirt that I tucked in. And I walk in, I'm thinking, this is like New York architecture, and I walk in and it's like two dudes in like jeans and t-shirts. And I was like, totally like threw me back, like this is not at all what I expected. Um, and then, you know, they were like, hey, uh, we got this small firm, we've got a couple of projects, like they had one uh, little house, and, and they were like, you know, we can offer you a job, it's going to be 10 bucks an hour, and you'll be like, the lowest guy of the three of us, so you're going to kind of do whatever we don't want to do. Um, and so I was going to be like the boss of like 20 people to like Brooklyn, knowing nobody in this really shabby, crappy building that was like, um, you know, on the edge of my comfort zone. And I was like, I'm in. Like, I want to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm like, all right, I'm ready. So he goes, okay, cool. Why don't you start tomorrow? And I was like, um, well. Actually, uh, I had a, like a vacation plan because I was um, gonna go, you know, visit some. Because I had nothing. I, I didn't bring any clothes with me. I, you know, he thought I lived in Queens, but I, I still lived in Oregon. I had a full apartment and everything. So I, I negotiated with them to start instead of that Thursday, which was the next day to start on Monday. And so I, I literally like flew back that night, went back, packed up my mom, came up, packed up my whole apartment, put it in the back of her car. And um, I flew to New York that that uh, that Sunday night with like a, a duffel bag, and um, that was like 11 years ago. Um, and uh, and so I, I I started there on Monday morning, and literally just by incredible chance, 
uh, that firm ended up getting the contract to do uh, the American Apparel uh, stores, and that started with one, and then two, and then three, and all of a sudden it just exploded into uh, an endless number. And so, because I had business experience but very little architecture experience, I kind of became more of a, a business person, a developer of, of, of retail stores. And so, um, you know, it's just one of those things where I went from, like literally on the first day, I was like, I fixed the sink because it had a drip. I like organized a bunch of notebooks. Um, I had to go to the hardware store and buy some like shelf brackets to like hang up some shelves in the office and, and, and I was willing to do that um, because I felt like it was building towards something bigger. Like I felt like everything that I did, every small step was gonna be towards something more meaningful in the future. And, um, and so, you know, within the span of about three months, everything had changed. I had gone from being like really the, the lowest person doing whatever kind of um, crappy work someone wanted me to do to being responsible for my own projects, um, you know, a few million dollar budget to build out a store in Brooklyn. And then from there, I just, I, I went to, I was traveling the world, I went to pretty much every city in the United States to look for American Apparel locations. I was, you know, in London and Tokyo and Paris. And so it just sort of like, for me, it was a real um, important thing to go through that process of just the, being willing to let everything go. All of my sort of expectations, all my, you know, um, feelings like perception from my parents, from my friends, from everybody about what I was doing and just do what felt, you know, right for me, what felt true to who I was. And so, a um, similar thing happened with me work, and again, um, the whole slides are gone and everything, but, um, but I was in this building in Brooklyn, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a cool building. It was full of, like, a lot of, a lot of businesses doing cool stuff. A lot of people who were like, like there was this woman I remember who just loved hats, you know? And she was like, I'm gonna become a hat maker. And I mean, who wears hats? I mean, some people do, but she was like, I'm all about hats. And so she started a company that was, you know, making like the coolest hats in Brooklyn. And, you know, she, she had a tiny little space, like, you know, the size of half of the stage. And she was all about it, you know? She came in every day, she busted her ass to like, you know, make the coolest hats that she could make. And I think that that sort of spirit was so apparent amongst all of the, um, these people, but there was nothing that was helping them. There was no, you know, when the internet went down in that building, no one cared. Like the landlord wasn't helping you. So this woman making hats or whoever the business was would spend, you know, half their day trying to solve their internet problem. They're on the phone with Verizon or whoever, AT&T, trying to, trying to solve problems. And so what we realized was that for a lot of people, for entrepreneurs, for startups, they spend a lot of time doing stuff that really doesn't help them grow their business, that's not core to what they want to do. And, um, and so we felt like if we can create an environment where, where people are supported in you know, following their dream, following their passion, that, um, that it would be super fulfilling for us and it would also be really helpful for them. So about 2007, we started uh, you know, the first company that did this called Green Desk and then about a year later we, we sold that and started again um, two years later. And so we work became really a, a home for people who are you know, in that mindset of like, I want to bring something new to the world. I want to do something for me. I want to find a way to follow my passion and my dream, and uh, and and it's it's been an incredible run because you know since we started, the feedback and the, the uh, number of people who have come to us, the number of um, amazing employees, team members that have come to us, um, you know the number of investors that, that supported us, like I forgot the number, but I think I think we've raised like close to a billion dollars, like with the B, like that's crazy. And the reason for that is because people like many of you have changed their mindset. They've said, I'm not gonna take the easy road. I'm not gonna like get a job in you know, doing something I don't care about, but rather I'm gonna uh, make a decision to take the hard path, to make the leap towards entrepreneurship, towards doing something that I'm passionate about. And because we've created an environment that makes that easier, um, we're just, we're trying to satisfy the demand. I and mean, we have about 33,000 people, 35,000 people across the world now. And a lot of people will say, oh, there's so many people, that's big. And I'm like, 35,000, there are like 30 million people right now who are in this mindset, and they're everywhere. 
everyone is changing from this, you know, uh, feeling of sort of having a job just to like pay the bills to like having a job to do something that they care about and, that, and that's meaningful to them. So we think it's just the start of a major global shift of a, of a revolution and I think that you know, the reason why we're particularly excited um, about Detroit is that, again, w where you may not feel it if you're here as much as we feel it from the outside, but we feel like Detroit is a real sort of symbolic um, city for, for that sort of, you know, uh, entrepreneur story and for that entre entrepreneur uh, spirit. So um, we think that, you know, it's not going to be long before um, things really or I think they already happened, but that they continue to happen and that all these things that people are talking about are really going to come true and that, um, you know, it's going to be held up as, as an example of, of an incredible, uh, you know, renewal and, and change uh, through the effort and talent and, and, uh, and passion of people who were determined to make a difference. So um, I'm happy to, you know, um, hopefully play a tiny, tiny, tiny part in that. Um, and I'm, I'm super excited to you know, spend more time here and, and to learn as much as I can to, to, to do a part, um, to do my part. So um, I don't know how much time we have left. Thanks a lot for having me. And uh, if you have any questions, it would be, I'd be happy to answer um, anything about anything. I've been asked to speak at a thing in Chicago in the two weeks, and the topic they asked me to speak on, which I, I, I went ahead and changed, was saying the upside of gentrification. And I...